when you get the mindset correctly, like you can do it. Like that's why I'm in help. Hello and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 332. Today, my guest is Sensei Alan Lau. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick Martial Arts, and I am a passionate fan of the traditional martial arts. So we do this show for you, likely another passionate fan of the traditional martial arts, because martial arts is great stuff. It brings us together. It helps us grow. And truly, I think if we really get down to it, the world is a better place because we train. You can find all of our products at whistlekick.com. Many of them are even on Amazon. And you can find all of our episodes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Sign up for the newsletter. Be notified about new projects, new products. Maybe get a discount code and get some behind the scenes info. We only do one or two a month. We're not going to bombard you. We're definitely not going to sell your information. Just to help you give more context to what we do here at Whistlekick and hopefully enhance your experience as a martial artist. But let's talk about today's guest. Sensei Alan Lau was born in Hong Kong, but he's now living in the Northeast, practices judo, he's a Muay Thai practitioner, he's an instructor. But overall, through everything we talked about, my biggest takeaway was how deeply integrated martial arts was to the way he saw the world. It's certainly one thing to do martial arts, but to be a martial artist, to act as a martial artist outside of training is a whole other thing. And I feel like today's guest exemplifies that. So let's welcome him to the show. Sensei Lau, welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. Oh, thank you so much, Jeremy. Uh, it's, it's an honor. It's a, a pleasure, a privilege to have you here on the show. And you know, we're going we're gonna to talk about martial arts. We're going to talk about you, talk about your, your journey, your story. Listeners know that you know, I love what I do. I get to talk to people about martial arts, which I, I just think is the, the best thing in the world. I mean, it, wouldn't you agree? <laughs> Talking about I martial arts? I have to uh, agree 100% because the way I look at martial arts is really the way of life. So. What do you mean by that? Uh, a lot of things, um, you know, you learn in martial arts community is really not just about physical. It's a lot more about the mental aspect of things. And since I'm a big fan of Bruce Lee, so, you know, he was a uh, philosopher on top of uh, being a uh, great martial artist. Uh, so I took that away from him a lot. Mm. There certainly does seem to be a lot of overlap between topics of philosophy and topics of importance in martial arts. And some of the listeners may know I was a philosophy major, I, I double major, but one of those in college was philosophy. So I'm happy to talk philosophy all day. Maybe that's why I love martial arts so much, though I started martial arts first. Maybe I love philosophy because of martial arts. Yeah, it could be. I, I can see both uh, going hand in hand. Yeah. You mentioned Bruce Lee. How did he come to have an influence on your martial arts thought process? He pretty, he pretty much um, kind of, I mean, I grew up in Hong Kong. So, and being, you know, in Chinese and in the world of like, you know, all kind of the westernized, you know, civilization, he actually did a lot for the Chinese community more than anybody could ever imagine. Mm. So, you know, you know, um, he just pretty much bring, bring the Chinese people up and, you know, make people interested into the Chinese martial arts and kind of spread the world, mm. you know, I mean, I mean, the martial arts itself around the world. Sure. No, obviously anybody listening to this show knows who Bruce Lee is, knows about the impact of Bruce Lee. And here we are, if I'm doing my math correctly, 45 years after his death, he's still the most influential martial artist on the planet. What would the I, folks... I, Sorry? Yeah, and I think that's because he wasn't just a, a martial artist, because he also a philosopher. 
And I think that is what carry on for so long mm. After, mm. After, his, after his death. I would agree. Absolutely. I, I think his contributions were so much deeper than simply technique. Uh, the, the, I mean, his, his books are still considered required reading in many martial arts schools. Recently, we had on Mr. Matthew Polly, who wrote a, a very in-depth biography on Bruce Lee and uh, called Bruce Lee, A Life, uh, episode 305. If anybody wants to check that one out. Now, what would those of us who did not grow up in Hong Kong, what, what would be different for us if we had grown up in Hong Kong as it relates to Bruce Lee and his influence? Um, he pretty much made, he just pretty much made the people proud. He was, he was really that revolutionist that really brought, you know, the Chinese people like on their feet in a sense, because now you got to realize, you know, where he came up is, you know, shortly after the World War II, you know, we were pretty, you know, the Chinese pretty much, you know, got owned, you know, got conquered by the Japanese and all the bad things happened and all the stuff. So, you know, the war ended in 1945 and then the communism started to take over and pretty much, you know, the allies, you know, they all got a piece of China and, you know, and Chinese people were actually in a really, really bad place, you know, until really Bruce Lee kind of, you know, kind of brought the Chinese people up, you know? Mm. You know, this is fascinating to me because it's a perspective that not only do I not have the context for, it's one I hadn't even considered. The idea of growing up in China and looking at Bruce Lee not just as a hero, as a martial artist, but a hero as a Chinese individual. Oh, yeah. He, yeah. I mean, he, he just like idolized throughout China, well, especially, you know, from Hong Kong, you know, the Hong Kong people. And um, he really made a lot of progress for the Chinese people, especially here in America, more than anybody, you know, can think of. Mm. That's really, really interesting. Now, was he the reason you got into martial arts? Um, I got into martial arts when I was 18, uh, when I started, you know, college, uh, when I get into more seriously. But, you know, when you're growing up, you know, kind of like the Canadians, you know, the babies born with a hockey stick in their hands. <laughs> but, if you, but if you, you know, Chinese and stuff, you pretty much, you know, somebody always knows some Kung Fu martial arts and, you know, Maybe not in, you know, old school style or whatnot, but, you know, somebody always knows something. So in the neighborhood. All right. Now you went to college in Hong Kong or? No, I went to college in Boston. In, okay. In East. Okay. So there, I, for, forgive me for observing, but there, there, I think there's a bit of irony there. You, you grew up in Hong Kong looking yeah. up to Bruce Lee. Yeah. Identifying with the martial arts community and you don't get serious about it until you come here. So what, what was it about coming to the United States that you said, okay, now it's time. Uh, pretty much at the time kind of looking for, you know, activities to do, you know, and, uh, and pretty much, you know, even though you technically an adult and 18, but you really just finding yourself as a matter of fact, I'm still finding myself at 39 years old right now, but, you know, that's like, you know, it's a continuous improvement, you know? So, um, so yeah, so I started officially judo, as a matter of fact, uh, at 18 at Northeastern University in Boston. And why judo? Because that's what the only club sport that I was really interested in. And pretty much the rest of history I've been doing it since. Okay, so you are still a judo practitioner? Uh, yes, I am, yeah. Okay. All right. And you said that you're, you're 39, so 18 to 39. So we've got over 20 years of you participating in judo. Yeah. What was it that you found in judo that you didn't have before? Uh, I would say community. We got really good clubs in the New England area. Um, one of the Olympic training center is, you know, is in Wakefield, Massachusetts. And we just have many, many local clubs here. Um, 
in the area just really good. And um, especially the club that I'm with now, uh, because the location and we have a lot of people from different countries, you know, come and go, you know, they stay for a couple of years, a year or even months, and they all bring a little piece of them. So um, into the club and into the environment. So uh, you just gain a lot of different perspectives. Mm. So. Did you... Did you know early on in your training that this would be something you'd be doing for a long time? Or did it seem like just a college phase? No, no, because uh, after college, I was struggling really keeping up with martial arts, uh, with judo in particular, because, um, you know, hard to find parking in Northeastern and, you know, as a uh, visitor uh, per se, you know, the real estate in Boston is just so expensive, and special, especially for parking. So it's hard to find parking. So I should stopped for a good five years until 2008. I start picked that up again. Mm-hmm. And then, and with that, I also start pick up, uh, doing Muay Thai, traditional Muay Thai at around the same time as well. So okay. I've been doing Muay Thai about since about 2008 until okay. now as well. All right. So, so not only did you resume your training, you resumed your training and started new training. What did those five years look like that you went back with with such gusto? Oh, just uh, life, you know, when you first started working full time after college and all the things that they promised you in college and the finals, you know, majority of my fault. And so you really have to just uh, find your way, working, finding yourself again, uh, getting into a routine, finding a good club. Uh, getting a really good instructor at the places, it's not easy, mm. especially at today's, you know, day and age. You know, while I, while I guess you've always been that way, but, you know, as older you get, you know, you kind of know what you want. And then it's uh, very difficult to find a club that you really want to just settle with. Not settle with, but like to be belong to, like mm. perhaps not settle yeah. Yeah, well, I, I was hearing the word settle as in settle into, as in, in kind of find your space. Right, right, yes. The topic of how to choose a school or, or choosing one school over another is something that, that we talk about a bit on this show. We've done entire episodes on it with, you know, advice and everything. As someone who's been through that process, how did you choose your schools? Um. For me, it's really the student, how they act uh, when you, as a newcomer, as well as how the instructor handle himself or herself or themselves. Um, I am a strong believer that uh, just like, you know, a a child, they are a product of the parent. So how they act is a product of how they've been, you know, the parenting. So to me, uh, how the student around me act is really telling me how the teachers are, have been teaching his or her students. So I go from, you know, the low of the totem pole and see, you know, if, if, if they treat a white belt with respect and, you know, and all the stuff and even the classmate, you know, maybe a person only been doing it for five months for me or, or the student instructors, you know, you know, with the same line with me and treat me with respect and with open arms. And I can kind of have a good indication of how the teachers are teaching. Yeah. If it goes the other way around, all they do is, is I take the newbies, you know, put them in a the corner and, you know, show them X, Y, Z and, you know, whatever. And then not much, you know, if I don't feel like the time being invested in the new students, and you know that's kind of how I decide to choose to sure. um, to stay or not. Sure. And I understand, you know, that you know, martial art is, is you know as much as uh, me doing it for passion, and you know, also for some people, it's doing it for you know financial reason as well. So when you invest in, into something, you know, you're looking for return. So if you have a lot of people just come and go and try and understand the, you know. The um, you know, the way of you know, kind of business work. So, you know, it's a you know, give and take situation. Mm. Yeah. Now, I'm I'm going to take a stab in the dark that 
as long as you've been training, you at least are are helping teach some classes, if not have your own? I, I'll, I'll confess, I, I don't know the answer. Do you have your own school or are you teaching? Uh, I do not have my own school, okay. but I but I am a, uh, I help out with the kids at my local um, judo club. And okay. also I teach the, uh, also one of the backup instructors for the adult classes oh, okay. uh, for the judo program. And uh, I have taught uh, Muay Thai in different schools and stuff like that, but I do not have my own school. All right. And, and you know what? Certainly no judgment there. I don't have my own school. I, I did in the past and, and have found that it's a lot of work, as, as, as you know. You get all, the, all the challenge of teaching plus all of the back end, the logistics, the business, all of that, all that stuff that needs to happen. But what I'm curious about is, you know, you sound like a pretty thoughtful person, you know, talking about the way that you selected your schools. How, has those obser- how have those observations, your experience, in different schools, how has that impacted you as an instructor? Um, so everybody have their way of doing things, and I have, you know, I, you know, I'm always, you know, open ears and listen to ideas or you know, um, you know, uh, critics and all the stuff. But at the end of the day. You cannot please everybody. So if I have a system, or if you have a system that you strongly believe in, and um, you know to stick to it, and then you you know sign off on it and you pry with it, you know, then I just kind of go do the same way as I do. Like I'm pretty old school, so like the way of the way I teach is very fundamental and very stern at first. Mm-hmm. So uh, some people would you know in today's day and age, you know, people many people like, you know, instant gratification. So, you know, my way of teaching might not be able to hold many students because you kind of have to kind of go through the whole kind of read up process by itself, you know, but, you know, the people that who stays with me, you know, usually, you know, uh, are the people that are really dedicated to it. So, you know, you gain some, you lose some. So <laughs> it, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, it, for me, it was a little bit easier once I realized that I wasn't the only martial arts school. I wasn't responsible for sharing martial arts with everyone. That the folks that jived with my school, my our culture, the way I taught, those were the folks that belonged there. And there were two other schools in town. They they had options that, and some of the folks, you know, went went on to other schools after trying mine, and and vice versa. And you know, you probably have something similar. It, it, it to me, it seems like a um, like it's it's a load off. It, it lessens the responsibility. You don't have to be the the be all end all for martial arts instruction in your area. Well, I mean, you know, just to say, you know, different strokes for different folks. So, yeah, totally, you know, people doesn't like my style. You know, maybe they can find a home at different people, different teaching style. And and I'm happy for that. You know, at the end of the day, all, all I really want to do is to spread the knowledge, you know, of the martial art and make the martial art grow. So even with me or with another instructor, you know, I really, it does, I really don't care in a sense. You know, as long as someone is really learning the art, you know, enjoying the art, you know, spreading the art, you know. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. In your time training, I'm sure you've come across a lot of, a lot of good stuff, a lot of weird stuff, interesting, funny, exciting. When you think back over your time and all of those stories, which is your favorite one? Hmm. This is, this is a tough one because I, I don't know any of that is i mean they are kind of fun at the end of the day right but it, you know it's going through the process is always the hardest um i don't really have any particular story that is really like wow it's very interesting but um uh, maybe maybe i will say so so i have a grandmaster that in muay thai that i currently um you know studying under and I've gone to Thailand a couple of times to train with him and all the good stuff. So until 
I met that grandmasters to me, I was only like tunnel vision because I only have, you know, like again, so now the downside of what my approach is, you kind of sometimes get tunnel vision in the sense that because you only have, you know, uh, one instructor in doing his and his and her way versus, you know, even though I train with other people, but you know, I'm very old school and in terms of understand, you know, just under the same, you know, um, lineage, if you will. Mm. So anyway, so until, you know, I found the, the grandmaster, which is, um, my, my, um, instructor was using the, the name under until like I met, met him over in Thailand and he just like, what <laughs> pretty much is what you've been doing is, I wouldn't say wrong. He is like, it's a different ways of doing things. So pretty much, you know, I went there with a, an idea that, you know, for, you know, scale of, you know, zero to 10, I was, you know, maybe in a five, you know, figured that time I've been doing Muay Thai for about, I don't know, eight years, nine years or so. And then, um, pretty much <laughs> I started at like thinking myself as, as a five, got down to negative two and then came back to like a one or two. So that would be like a very interesting thing. And, um, and you know, ever since that time, you know, like you, I think, you know, you really need as much as you want, you should be loyal to your instructor, but, um, or the schools or whatnot, but you should really cross train, especially, you know, from the same lineage and, you know, different people and just, um, really should explore and learn different things mm. and then you know just really want to know you know what's good or what's bad even though it's you know it's not really that funny but to me that was pretty funny because entire time i'm pretty much getting my butt kicked for <laughs> two weeks <laughs> every day non-stop you know it's a pretty powerful experience and, and we've had a couple other folks on the show who have had a similar one and and i gotta say i i love to train and I love to get my butt kicked in a uh, in an educational way, but that sounds yes. like such an intense environment. Is it is it as intense as it sounds? Uh, I think to me it was more of a mental okay. thing because for me martial arts is like you know ninety percent mental, ten percent physical. Like you know, what I mean, like you know, even though these things can be physical demanding, but when you get the mindset correctly like you can do anything like that's my mentality and um it's really the mental because to me at that point i said to myself like what am i even doing here learning muay thai like i learned it for eight years nine years and i don't know jack <laughs> you know what i'm saying like mm. so that was you know but then but then you kind of like one of those things you kind of build it you know build yourself back up and just start learning from 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 you know ground zero Mm. So, what was the biggest thing that you brought back from that time training? Oh, just the whole system that my grandmaster uses. Okay, um, he's actually being recognized by the Thai government to embrace his system to be taught in schools all around Thailand. Oh wow, that's awesome! Yeah, yeah. So he's you know. He's, he's done a lot of work. So he, so the reason I like, I like him is because he got the same mentality of Bruce when he was, you know, you know, doing the uh, Jikundo things is really about spreading the knowledge and the culture, you know, behind, you know, like when I do martial arts, I don't just do the art itself, but like, like why the art was created, like why, you know, certain things happen, like, you know, then you have to understand the culture aspect of things. So you kind of know why, you know, certain things happen, you know, like you cannot take it, take things with the face value. You have to understand like why that much I was created. And, you know, and then you understand the cultural thing and the time that was created and, you know, why there was a need for it. And, uh, so, you know, things like that. Now, one of the things that, that I'm kind of struck by whenever someone cross trains is the combination, you know, what, what is the combination of martial arts that they do lead to? And you are 
so very close to the ra- the, the re- often replicated formula for folks participating in mixed martial arts. Judo plus Muay Thai is very close to Jiu-Jitsu plus Muay Thai. Is that something that you that you ever think about? I mean, is is competing in that way something that that um, ever... well in MMA? Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, I'm, you? I'm also a uh, well, I'm also one of the officials for for um, MMA judge and uh, referee in the New England area. So okay. with that, pretty much I cannot partic- participate. And, uh, you know, I'm also one of the trainers for Muay Thai judge and uh, referee in the areas as well. So, so you know, for me, it's more for recreational. Uh, I won't pro- pretty much, you know, cl- you know, just clubs practicing and stuff. Won't be competing in that big stage. Okay. All right. Well, I wasn't too far off if you found your way into MMA. As a as a referee, I mean, there, there's there's something in that combination that that tends to tends to line up for for folks. I don't know what it is. I can't say, but yeah, yeah, MMA is definitely you know those guys are definitely you know boys and girls. You know they definitely tough. Definitely a different mentality. You know they days in days out they have to grind all day. You know I give them a lot of respect. You know just the fact that they someone who trains enough just to step inside the cage or the ring is is uh, should be real proud of themselves. And, you know, hopefully they have a good team support them and uh, in order to do that. I completely agree. It's no uncommon occurrence for someone to go through something difficult, something challenging in their life. But as martial artists, we have a different set of tools that we can use as we work through those challenges. Tell us about a time in your life where things were challenging and how you were able to work through it. Uh, one thing, you know, about a martial art teacher is really the mental toughness. And that's really, and the, and the philosophy, and like, you know, I keep going back to these philosophy side of things because how I carry myself, you know, as a person is have a lot of, um, uh, influence from the martial arts, especially from Bruce Lee. So obviously I could bring him back up, but, um, it's really, you know, you know, if you ever watched, you know, um, the way of the dragon, the remake of Bruce Lee, you know, how he was, you know, uh, supposed to be paralyzed, you know, he won't be walking again. And then he pretty much have the F you mentality, you know, you're not telling me what to do. And, you know, I'm just keep continue improving myself on my own. That's kind of, you know, um, how I kind of a- adopted, you know, I, you know, I live my life really, you know, with try to minimize my regrets, you know, I, you know, that's why I could be, you know, very frank and stern on certain things, but, you know, I, as long as I don't offend people and, uh, you know, that's will make you strong in terms of mentally and, you know, life, you have good times and bad times, you know, and, and that mentality really keep me in line and focused because if you keep dwelling on things, you might losing yourself sometimes. And sometimes you just need to step back, stay strong, refocused, look at the big picture, and then, you know, look at the end result, what you want to do at the end of the day, you know, is, you know, and then you can reevaluate. So I think that right there is really teach, you know, have taught me you know, really how to act as a person and how to face, you know, life decisions of, you know, easy or difficult. And, and, you know, you know, to me, the thought process is the same. You know, you are me, I'm a pretty much an end result oriented guy and how to get there is, you know, you know, you have multiple ways to get there, but then the reason I want X and then I will do my best, you know, to, to achieve it. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of how I, kind of carry myself. Right on. When you think about the folks that you've trained with, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, not just your instructors, but folks in Thailand, folks that you've trained with here, maybe even friends in Hong Kong. If you had to name one or maybe two of them who were the most influential on 
who you are as a martial artist. And that doesn't necessarily mean your skill set. It could mean your philosophy. It's really however you define it. Who would that person or those couple people be? So the people that I have dealt with, like in person, not not just some fictional guy, right? Not fictional. You know what? It it, it could be fictional. It could be you know. it, It could it could be Bruce Lee. You know, we've already spoken about him. I, I don't like putting parameters on the answers to these questions. The way you interpret yeah. them tells us just as much as what you say. Um, I would say, so, so now I'm going back the whole philosophy. So, so have you heard of uh, the art of war by Shinji? Absolutely, Shinji. All right, so Shinji was definitely one of the guys. That I would like to, uh, that uh, that would have influenced on my in my martial art training because because that his philosophy really helped you. You know, you can be physically strong or weak or whatever. You can pretty much using your mind to set up to what good or what's best for you. Um, so that right there, definitely, um, really, I, I think every single martial artist should read that book. Uh, if you know Chinese, read the Chinese version and then look at the translation version and then, and then you can absorb whatever you think, uh, into your own interpretation. Um, then the uh, second book, you know, the other person is uh, the Book of Five Rings. Uh, that's by the Japanese uh, martial artist. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty much talk about the you know the five elements and how each element is. But then, but you know that's all the philosophy. But then you know obviously Bruce Lee would be one of the big influential person. Um, um, you know in my, you know at the early beginning, and then my current grandmaster from Thailand, he definitely almost like a living legend to kind of doing what I want to do and what Bruce was doing when he was alive in terms of spreading the martial arts and really just, um, you know, he, so my, my grandmaster is, is he has so much knowledge, but yet he can boil down to the basic to even a dum dum can do it. And that's when I know a teacher is really, really know his and her craft, because fighters not doesn't that, that you know a good fighter doesn't mean they are good teachers. You know we have seen you know like with football player they when they try a you know, basketball player you know they can try you know they can be one, one of the legends, but yet when they try to be coaching, then they you know they fail because the people that he tried or she tried to coach to doesn't have the same ability as you know him or herself. And in order for you to break down everything in so fundamental and someone off the street with the right attitude can pick it up, to me, that's the real, really, like, real good teacher. And that's something that I strive for, to become one day at that kind of level. Yeah. Yeah. Powerful stuff. I'm not even going to try to. (laughs) <laughs> tack on to that. I'm just, yeah. just going to go on. Now, the flip side of that question. If you could train yeah. with someone that you haven't anywhere in the world, anywhere in time, who would that be? Oh, man. That I haven't anywhere in time. Um, let's see here. This is very difficult. Um well, obviously, you know, Bruce <laughs> would, you know, definitely do up there. And actually, uh, Eatman would be one of the instructors that I would like, love to train with. Sure. So, um, uh, you know, you've seen a movie by, uh, you know, the Sam um movie with, uh, you know, about the Yitman series. So, so Yitman was the Wing Chun instructor of Bruce, you know, resides in Hong Kong. And, uh, um, you know, just uh, another beautiful philosophy where an martial was created by the female 
and been adopted many, many different kinds of martial arts around the world. And that's just so powerful. Mm. So, you know, it's all about, you know, most martial arts in China is very strong in a sense, very stern, very big forms, you know, very, you know, very, um, I wouldn't say static, but uh, it's very, like, you know, strong present, but yet the Wing Chun is, is the total opposite of it, but yet it's just being adapted so many, so many, um, you know, all over the world. And in a sense, that's where I ended up doing judo and Muay Thai. You have, you know, quote unquote, the gentle way with, you know, judo, and then you have the very stern side of, you know, traditional Muay Thai. So. Yeah, for sure. Hmm. Let's talk about competition. I know yeah. judoka tend to have participated in in some way. They're they're a good way to test your skills. And, and I mean, let's be honest, it's kind of hard to to practice judo to play judo by yourself. So, has competition been something you've gotten into with that? Oh yeah, I, I still do about. Um two to three judo tournaments a year locally nothing okay. nothing big just to uh support the um the competition scene you know i'm a heavyweight you know just pretty much try to encourage more people to do judo you know you know you get those are the brackets usually have uh, less people so i try to help out you know fill out the brackets in a sense that you know encourage more people to you know compete nice and how about Muay Thai? Any any competition on that side? No, I don't. I don't compete in Muay Thai. There's more just uh, practice, in a sense. All right. Now you've brought up Bruce Lee. You've brought up Ip Man. Are you a fan of martial arts movies? Am I a fan? Uh, yeah, of course. Okay. Because Hong Kong is really known for their stuntmen. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the. If if there is a a hub a center point in the world for martial arts movies, it's definitely Hong Kong. Yeah, they uh, actually they um, Jackie Chan actually uh, they ha he had a stunt group um, very popular in the eighties and nineties, and um, pretty much all the stunt around the world that you see they 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 do a lot of uh, uh, choreography on for the movies. Hmm. Did you grow up going to movies, Shaw Brothers movies and and such? Um, yeah, I mean in Hong Kong, you know, definitely you you will watch Jackie Chan's movie because he always does a um does a what's it called? Like a Chinese New Year uh movies. So like one, at least once a year he will have a big movie. Uh so you know, big fan of him, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um and then um it's like actually I don't I didn't actually watch any of the Bruce Lee's movie until I was older because um really um didn't have the way of really you know to watch the movies until like now. Like right now it's so much easier mm, to uh, you know you Okay. You know, go to like Netflix and other thing, you know, Amazon Prime, <laughs> all right. kinds of stuff, you know. Right. So I, um I guess that makes sense. At at the time that you were growing up they weren't in theaters. You know, they were too far gone no, for theaters. No, no. And, you know, those those were... Um, I mean, the, the movies we tend to think of, if, if I'm remembering correctly, were American releases. So, you know, getting them on video, you know, must must have been difficult. I could, I could see that. That makes sense. Yeah, they were, they were my mom's generation. Pretty much I lived through how he was through my parents, you know, word of mouth mm -hmm. until older that I actually have a chance to watch it for myself. Sure. Are there any more of, of the the modern martial arts movies that you've seen recently that really strike a chord for you? Ooh, recently, um, mm, well, obviously the Yemen series are good. Um, they, they, they've done very nicely. Um, so there was a movie back in the early nineties was by Jet Li. That's one of the, um, you know, that's one of the movies I like to watch that kind of more like style. They call, uh, 
once upon a time in China. Mm -hmm. So he portrayed as um, one of the um, a martial artist who pretty much escaped the communism and then went to went to southern China and eventually um, at a school in Hong Kong for a very brief uh, period of time. So, um, you know, so that movie is, you know, very like has strong kind of movie that that really, you know, um, you know, it's towards the, the, the end of the whole dynasty time and, you know, accepting the new way of the culture and stuff. So, so, you know, you know, that's kind of like, my mindset kind of like around that, that period of time, you know, the early, you know, I would say maybe between like thirties or forties time, time frame, because that's where many people had to struggle. And then, and that's always the saying, you know, the chaos create heroes. So, so uh, that's, you know, that kind of movies around the time frame that's really attracts me the most. Yeah, I can see that. Now, as we look into the future, as you consider your training and teaching and, and all the other things that you have going on, what are your goals with your martial arts training? Are, are there, you know, are, are you looking to hold the path you're on? Or are you looking to add another style, drop one, achieve a certain rank, attend a certain um, training space? I mean, you know, what, what's, what's keeping you motivated to be dedicated? To, to me, ranking this lifestyle. To me, yeah. to me, um, you know, like I said to you before, you know, martial arts to me is really the way of living. So to me, ranks don't mean anything. To me. Like I can, I can be a white belt for the rest of my life for all I care. Like I really don't care about that. But it's all about knowing the knowledge, knowing the arts, understanding the arts, and spread the arts, and really spread the art in a way that a person off the street can have no prior knowledge can understand. That's my whole goal. Um, you know, um, because it's, let's be honest, martial art is not easy. Any, any arts that you do, if you want to do it right, people spend decades of their time just to perfect, you know, or strive for profession into certain things. And, you know, and I just have to stay focused because, you know, there's so many trains, you know, going on all the time. But, you know, you have to stay true to the arts and really spreading the fundamental and then let your student how to mix and match them. And that's kind of like my goal, if that makes sense, because I can't do it all. I cannot do it all, you know, but I'd like to be specialized in a couple of things that yet, you know, so. I know how to teach on that. I know what works, you know, almost like a, like a proven track record in a sense, you know, and that's kind of what strikes me as a, you know, practitioner, you know, as a teacher or whatnot. And, you know, that's what, you know, keep me going. Now, if people want to, want to reach you, if they want to find out about your school, maybe they're in the, the New England area or they're traveling through and they want to, check out what you've got going on or they want to find you online, you know, how would they do that? Uh, they, you know, Facebook is the easiest, obviously, you know, my name, Alan, A-L-E-N-L-E-U. Um, you know, that's what they can find me on Facebook. Obviously, um, I have a lot of things going on. So obviously my choice is my passion and, but I have other things going on at the same time. So it's, uh, I just often multitask, but you know, but I always go for seminars or go to different seminars or teach seminars just to really exchange ideas and, you know, just, um, you know, no, but no one knows everything. That's why that's, you know, that's always, uh, stay with me. So you always, and it doesn't matter from who it could be a brand new person just off the street and, could be just, you can be enlightened that way, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. My, my original instructors taught me that even a white belt on their first day, if you're really paying attention, has something to teach you. Oh, of course. Yeah. 
And it, it very well may, may be that it's much harder to teach a white belt on their first day than you would like it to be. <laughs> I learned that lesson yes, many, definitely. many times. You know, but um, but that's that's kind of, but that's when I go back to, you know, if if you can break it down, and to the point that even the white belt, if someone never done it before, can try to get a basic understanding about it and not being afraid of it. I mean, like we all we are afraid of something that we have no uh, ideas about, right? I mean, that's just a human nature. But if you can conquer the fear in your head, you know, in your mental and in your physical things, you know, that person is pretty much unstoppable. You know, that's just my, you know, that's just kind of how I approach it. You know, it's a fear as older we get. That's what kind of prohibit us from doing a lot of things. Like, you know, for instance, now you're older, you have more responsibilities. So now, all right, if I do X, Y, Z, what happened if I'm out of work because I do X, Y, Z? So now that kind of stopping you. But if you look at kids, you know, two, three years old, I mean, they have no fear. I mean, they, they do tumbling. They, you know, they can stretch their legs, you know, way behind the head. You know, they got all, they got everything going for them, you know? Right. So uh, it, it's, it's quite interesting how life really plays out. I really enjoyed my conversation with Sensei Lao. I appreciated his perspective, his thoughts on teaching, on training, on cross-training. You know, certainly here's someone who reflects quite a few of my ideas, but also has a passion and a perspective all his own. And I don't know about you, but that enhances my perspective, my training, the way I look at my martial arts. Hopefully, you got even half of what I did from this conversation. If you want to check out the show notes where we have links and photos and all kinds of other good stuff, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. I just spent a few minutes on Sensei Lao's Instagram, and there's some good stuff on there. Some entertaining stuff, some personal stuff, some political stuff. It's no surprise. He's just as open in his social media as he was here in this conversation. And of course, you can find all of our products, all of our services at whistlekick.com. It's all here for you. Hopefully, we have things that you are interested in. If not, check back soon because there is so much on the way. It's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> it's a little overwhelming on our end. That's all I've got for you today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.